Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're here for the second special session that's being called pursuant to uh, Minnesota law to um, determine whether or not the governor's emergency powers shall continue. Um, as you're all familiar, Minnesota statute requires that uh, once every 30 days in a peacetime emergency that the governor provide the legislature with an opportunity to um, terminate the emergency powers. Um, I'm sure you heard from the Minnesota Senate an intention to terminate those powers. You will see in the Minnesota House of Representatives, we believe that it's important for those emergency powers to continue. The pandemic is concerning. Uh, patterns in the southern states are especially concerning if they reflect that when people go inside, uh, there is a, a little bit of a runaway contagion um, problem. Uh, knowing that Minnesotans will be going inside when it gets cold and that it does get cold here, in uh, late September, early October. Um, I think that it's clear on the record that the facts exist to continue the emergency and we'll, I'm sure, be talking about that on the House floor today. Uh, given that we have this opportunity to come into special session due to this statute uh, that requires the governor to call us back once every three days or once every 30 days, it gives us an opportunity to address other important issues before the state of Minnesota that the legislature normally does not have an opportunity to address uh, during the interim. We all know that COVID-19 um, interrupted the regular session and there was a lot of work during the regular session that we did not have the opportunity to complete. That is of course still on the table, uh, most significantly a bonding bill. Um, we all also are aware, um, because we talked about it extensively during the June 12th uh, to June 19th special session, that since the murder of George Floyd on May 25th, it is urgent that Minnesota act to reform our law to provide accountability um, for citizens to, to make sure that we have systemic change in policing and that we have real accountability. So not just that we have more rules and more training, but that we have mechanisms in place to hold police accountable to those high standards that we set for them. Minnesota's economy is uh, in rough waters. And so it's especially significant at this moment in time that we move forward on the jobs and local projects bill. Uh, there are also some tax cuts that we are taking a look at because um, we know that Minnesota businesses will be acquiring uh, capital to replace capital that was lost in, during the civil unrest. And that those entities that are currently able to continue being active in the economy, we want to incent that activity and allow that to continue. So um, in an ideal situation, you would see us very soon um, reaching an agreement on police reform and accountability. You would also see us very soon reaching an agreement on a bonding and tax package and a supplemental budget. Uh, those things are not yet complete. And so uh, Senator Gazelka and I have decided that it would be in the best interest rather than trying to rush through and cram uh, agreements together in the next 24, 48 hours to provide a mechanism where we can take longer if those agreements don't come to fruition in the next four, 24 to 48 hours. And that would allow us to return on Monday, July 20th um, to at that time pass any agreements that we are able to reach by then. And I will leave it there and turn it over to the majority leader. Good morning. In many ways, this is among or the most uh, demanding time for state government in our history. The pandemic, the economic uh, catastrophe brought about by the pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, civil unrest, and the deep uh, systemic uh, racist uh, system uh, that we have in many areas of our lives that have created deep disparities in our society are brought all in front of us at the same time. And we do, we do not have the choice to not engage and uh, try to address those issues as best we possibly can. We cannot afford to uh, have a vote to surrender to the coronavirus as a precondition for having a bonding bill. We cannot decide that it's more important to quibble about the governor's powers than it is to address COVID-19 pandemic. We cannot ignore the economic consequences of inaction on bonding on making sure that our neighborhoods in Minneapolis and St. Paul, which were destroyed by the civil unrest, have an opportunity to regrow and rebuild in a way that is consistent with their existing investment and character, these vibrant immigrant corridors with uh, businesses owned by people of color that really represents the American dream and the future of our state. We cannot afford to stand by and let that fall apart too. We have to take action. And Minnesotans should expect 
action from us. And so I hope that today we can get through quickly this notion that we should surrender to the coronavirus and let it do whatever it wants to Minnesotans instead of giving the governor the tools needed to combat it in the best way we possibly can. And we can move on to close out agreements on a number of very important issues that will affect the future of the state for years to come. The time for action is now, and I really hope that all sides can come together. It's a gut check moment, and we have to rise to this occasion. And I think we will start to see today and uh, for the rest of this week whether or not uh, Republican leaders are willing to join us in finding solutions to the problems that face all Minnesotans. With that, right. I think first, we're ready for questions. Yep, first question, first hand I saw was Peter Callahan. Hi, um, I haven't been here as long as most of these folks, but I've never seen bonding and taxes linked together. Can you explain that? Is that that's not going to be in one bill, is it? Is it just an agreement that if you do one, you will do the other? Yeah, uh, Peter, I don't know if you were here for House File 1812 in, um, I, I can't remember if it was 2009 or 2010, or um, for um, uh, the four years that um, Kurt Dutt was the Speaker of the House. Um, there are many times where issues get combined because neither issue on its own has enough votes uh, to be enacted. So very commonly, you will see um, a tax bill that both raises revenue and cuts revenue at the same time so that it can get um, enough votes to be passed. You will often see um, combinations, especially in the second year of a biennium, a supplemental budget typically encompasses several, um, several different subject matters. So with regard to bonding and taxes, it has always been the construct of the Republicans in the Minnesota Senate and the Minnesota House uh, actually as well, that they would not agree to a bonding bill over $1 billion unless they got tax cuts. And in order for uh, us to get the votes that we need to pass the bonding bill from Republicans, we need to put that tax cut in the bonding bill. If you're a conservative Republican and you're in a conservative Republican district, your voters do not want to see you spending more than a billion dollars on general obligation bonds in the state budget. But your voters also do want you to cut taxes. And so by putting these two issues together, we make it possible to have both a bonding bill and a tax bill where neither would be possible on their own. You know, conversely, Democrats do not have an interest in providing businesses with a tax cut right now. If we were going to provide a tax cut to anybody, we would provide it to, to individuals and families. Um, and so uh, for us to have both a bonding bill and a tax bill, they must be combined. Okay, so 60% vote for a tax bill just because it's inside the bonding bill, correct? Well, that's right. But again, it would not be able to pass the Minnesota House of Representatives if we're, we're not in the bonding bill, because right now the Democrats control the Minnesota House of Representatives, and it is not our first priority to cut taxes for businesses that are making money. It is our first priority to help uh, Minnesotans improve their lives. And by that, we mean uh, individuals and families. And when we look at economic security, we're looking at individuals and families. Um, Republicans, on the other hand, prioritize businesses. So that tax bill would not have enough votes to pass the Minnesota House if it were not inside the bonding bill. When do you do that? So the um, Ways and Means Committee will be meeting tomorrow morning to put that bill together. Um, it, we were really close to having it drafted for introductions, but we didn't want to uh, make the revisers stay up all night, um, two nights in a row. And so it, we'll be posting that as an amendment. It will be a delete all amendment to Mary Murphy's bonding bill, which will be up in um, the Ways and Means Committee tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Thanks. Okay, next question is from Esme Murphy. Uh, Speaker Hortman, you sound optimistic that agreements can actually be worked out in the next week on police reform and the bonding bill. Is that a fair assessment? I am uh, optimistic. Um, I don't think that failure is an option on police reform and accountability. When we all watched the video of George Floyd's last minutes of life, something changed in, in, in us and in Minnesota that, that can't be put right without taking action. We, we must take action. Um, 
we have to protect the lives of members of the community. We also have to create an environment where law enforcement has the trust and confidence of the community. They are not safe without the trust and confidence of the community. So in both the interests of um, individuals who are subject to policing and individuals who are engaged in policing, this is a basic safety issue. We have to take action. Um, in addition, the world is watching Minnesota, and I know people say that, and some people say, oh, well, you know, the world's only watching if you say the world's watching, or maybe the world's not watching. But George Floyd was murdered here in the state of Minnesota by a Minneapolis police officer. This is our problem. We have to address it. Businesses all over the world thinking about whether to move to Minnesota or whether to stay in Minnesota uh, are, are going to be looking at what kind of a place is Minnesota to, to be for our residents, whether they choose to stay in the state of Minnesota, whether they choose to stay in the city of Minneapolis, we have to address this issue or we put our, our state at risk from people's personal safety to the future economic health of our state. So I do not think that failure is an option here. I think everybody understands how high the stakes are. Uh, we've been working really um, almost around the clock, um, though gratefully not around the clock, on this um, because people don't do their best work between midnight and 5 a.m. Uh, we learned that on June 19th. Uh, but I really do think that, that we'll get there. There is a genuine desire on the part of everyone to get there. The question is, will the reform and accountability that Republicans are willing to live with be good enough for Democrats? And we are very serious about the, the reform and the accountability pieces of that. More rules, and more training are not going to change lives. What we need are consequences for failure to live up to the standards. I don't know, the majority leader may have something to add on that. No, I think the question was about your optimism for a deal. Yeah, okay. Have <laughs> I guess I'll have to ask you later if you're optimistic. <laughs> uh, all right, next question is from KSTP. Uh, what's been discussed surrounding specific funding for the rebuilding of the Twin Cities following the civil unrest? So the House passed the Promise Act in the last special session, which would direct money directly to the individuals, small businesses, and community organizations that were harmed by the civil unrest. Uh, and I think there's been this Republican uh, right-wing conservative talking point that somehow this is money that is going to the city of Minneapolis uh, or somehow benefits the mayor of Minneapolis or the governor of Minnesota, and therefore they want to make those two individuals pay before they will help these small businesses. And frankly, we've had zero assistance from the Minnesota Senate Republicans, while the other three caucuses have been willing to come forward and work out a deal and find a way to get resources to the businesses, to the individuals affected by the civil unrest. One thing we know for sure, the people who are out there protecting their homes, protecting their businesses, protecting community assets from fires and from the civil unrest, those people were not at fault. It was as though a tornado or fire uh, came through, a wildfire came through their neighborhoods. In Minnesota, we have a long tradition of sticking up for and helping communities hurt by that kind of disaster. And right now we are failing those people and Minnesota needs to step up and do the right thing for them. We've been pushing and pushing and pushing Senate Republicans to come to the table, but they have refused. We need to get going on this. We need to get going on it now. Okay, uh, I've got a lot of questions to try to get through here. Next one is Steve Karnowski. What are the actual chances of coming up with a compromise acceptable to both chambers on police accountability? Are they any better than last month? Uh, speaker, I think you kind of addressed this. If you have anything else to add on that? Well, uh, when we were together uh, June 12th through June 19th, remember we were all very fresh off of um, this item being put on our agenda uh, by George Floyd's um, death. And we were also uh, just a few days out of the civil unrest resolving and the, the extreme disruption um, to Minnesotans' lives changing. I mean, I'm not sure when the, um, when we stopped having uh, curfews and um, you know, really significant public safety concerns uh, all around the state. So coming in on June 12th, we had a large number of issues that were not on our, that had not been on our plate in the subject of discussion um, 
recently for most members, except for members of the Public Safety Committee. And so we had a really lot of uh, policy to understand in a very short period of time. The other thing is we hadn't engaged in conversations with each other a lot. Both sides were scrambling to get up to speed um, and to, to be clear about what they should put in their initial proposals and, and making sure that all of the members of their teams understood their own team's proposals before they made them public. So our conversations with each other about um, how to the mesh the differing approaches didn't really begin until midway through that June 12th to June 19th um, special session. Um, in order for a bill to become a law, it has to pass through the House, pass through the Senate. If there's disagreement, typically it goes to a conference committee. And at the moment where those bills go to conference committee, usually that's when the conversation begins of House and Senate. Well, that didn't, you know, that happened on Thursday night, June 18th. So really the conversation between Democrats and Republicans about how to find common ground and how to resolve differences has, has been going on for a relatively short period of time. And we are talking about monumental reform because we have to. What George Floyd's death made clear is that little changes aren't enough anymore. We need to see something significant. Um, so I, I think that we are in a very different place uh, here on Monday, July 13th than we were uh, back on Friday, June 12th in terms of our, the development of the conversation around these issues. Okay, one second here. Um, Brianna Beersbach has the next question. What are the sticking points that remain on police accountability measures? You know, I am not going to wade into those weeds at this moment. Um, I think um, there's a lot of issues that we have been discussing um, throughout. Uh, in terms of the differences, I, I, I probably can't, I'm not the right person to wade into those weeds, but I'll tell you um, the issues we're discussing are a ban on chokeholds, a ban on warrior style training, um, a sanctity of life standard where um, our number one priority is to preserve life and in interactions between law enforcement and uh, civilians. Um, looking at how do we make sure that citizens are both um, feeling that they're heard and that they are actually heard and that their voices are a part of the conversation um, going forward on police reform and accountability, not just today, not just here as we pass this bill in the legislature, but on a continuing basis as we continue to look at how to uh, modernize the practice of policing to make it more responsive to the community and more accountable to the community. So, um, you know, Senate File 104 that we passed and sent back to the Senate on June 18th is the um, is, is still the base um, conversation. There's there I do not believe there are new issues that have been put off the table, and I think the you know you saw 11:15 um, p.m. on on the night of Friday, June 19th, we took two significant issues off the table, and that was restore the vote and also primary jurisdiction in the attorney general's office. And those items are still off the table. All right, next on the list is Bill Werner. Hi, Madam Speaker and Mr. Leader. Um, and I guess I'm gonna steal a little bit of Jesse's question, next question, but I'll try not to steal too much of it. Um, what's the number that you have agreed on? We're hearing 1.35 or one and a half. And then also the, the question is, um, contingent on moving forward with that, given that you, you have put the tax piece in, um, albeit not your preference, but as part of the uh, agreement on this, um, is there anything then that needs to be done on the governor's emergency powers to get enough support from Republicans in your chamber? Uh, and if so, what, what are you talking about or what yet needs to be resolved there? Well, I have respectfully requested Minority Leader Doubt to de-link the issue of the bonding bill and the emergency powers. I think it's entirely within the right of the Minority Leader to continue to uh, fight the existence of the emergency powers with every fiber of his being and with every member of his party. I don't think that that um, concern and that mission of his has to be linked to our action on the bonding bill. And I think that um, Representative Doubt has a lot of innovative proposals about ways to deal with executive power during the COVID-19 pandemic that are slightly different from the existing emergency powers. And I think we should continue to explore that conversation. 
and uh, that we can make progress on that. I do not think it should be linked to whether the bonding bill goes forward or not, because there is a time sensitive nature with this bonding bill of getting the, the state ready to um, sell the bonds. And I'm not sure, I think you asked a numbers question. So the numbers are, the most significant number for Republicans is the number for general obligation bonds. And on general obligation bonds, Republicans have never gone above the 1 billion mark before. But in consideration for the fact that tax cuts are a part of this proposal, Republicans are willing to go to 1.35 in general obligation bonds. Uh, Senate Re or, um, House Republicans still have uh, $20 million worth of choices to make of what they would like to um, allocate. Um, their, their allocation is currently parked. We're waiting for input from them on that. Um, they've been heard and, and many of their priorities are already funded. But so the, the basic numbers are 1.35 billion general obligation bonds, 300 million in trunk highway bonds, and then 147 million in appropriation bonds and 38 million in cash. Um, and I can further detail that breakdown, but that might be a conversation for tomorrow if, um, unless people want more detail right now. Madam Speaker, can I just, just do one quick follow-up? So uh, Minority Leader Dowd has not said uh, that uh, the, uh, the issue of the governor's emergency powers is delinked from the bonding slash tax bill. Is that correct? He has not. That is my uh, request of, of um, I don't know, since May 2nd, since I guess he first linked them. Um, but right before I hopped on here, I just hopped off the phone with um, Leader Dowd and again, ask that he delink those issues. Um, and, uh, I don't think he's there yet. Um, okay. Peter Callahan asked about the housing bonds. There's 100 million in housing bonds, and that's within the appropriation bond number. So I'm going to do the additional detail. On the appropriation bonds, there's 100 million for housing investment bonds. There's 30 million for landfills. Uh, there is uh, 15 million for public television infrastructure of some kind, uh, $2 million for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. In the cash, there's 30 million that's expressly designated for projects that involve equity. There's $8 million for purchasing um, uh, wetland credits so that local roads can be built. And there's $779,000 to buy lab equipment for a Department of Agriculture lab. And then the transportation piece is really innovative um, as well. I guess I'll just say a couple things about that. There's 25 million in a new account um, called the project development account, and that's designed to get projects ready to go that aren't currently ready to be in the um, state road construction plan. And there's 84 million in state road construction, 58 million in MnDOT capital investments, and 110 million in uh, rail grade separation. Thanks, Madam okay. Speaker. All right, we've got just a few more minutes, so we'll try to go quick. I think you addressed most of Jesse Van Burkle's question. I think the only thing you haven't talked about was the 58 million in supplemental spending, uh, if we're still on board with that. Say that one more time. Uh, the 58 million in the supplemental spending, if we're uh, still on board with that number. Yeah, the presumption is that the agreement that was reached on June 19th is still valid. All right, John Croman's got the next one. Have you been able to communicate directly about the differences between post-board policy and outlawing chokeholds? Can you, I'm sorry, can you say that one more time a little bit more slowly? People are texting me about the bonding bill, so. <laughs> Have you been able to communicate directly about the difference between changing post-board policy and outlawing chokeholds? We have had conversations about that, but again, I am not the person that have that, uh, ask those questions. That would be uh, Chair Moran. Uh, Chair Mariani, uh, Chair Limmer, um, those would be the people. All right, next question from Kevin Featherly. Senator Gazelka says that the issue of George Floyd's death and the police response that caused it have been thoroughly vetted by lawmakers and that there is no further need for a separate set of Senate hearings to address that along the same lines as the Senate's Lawlessness Oversight Committee. He says that's unlikely to happen. Any reaction to that? Yeah, I think that the Senate's hearings are deeply offensive. I think that the video that they should start every single Senate hearing with is first the video of the last moments of Philando Castile's life, and then they should watch the video of the last moments of George Floyd's life, and that explains why there was civil unrest. 
I think it is entirely appropriate to continue to ask questions about the state's response to um, law enforcement needs as they arose that evening, the, the need for fire services, the need for police services, who was called upon, how did they respond? Um, but I think unless the inquiry is centered in understanding what happened to Philando Castile, what happened to George Floyd and so many other people like them, that the Senate is completely missing the point. Uh, we had a floor discussion in 2017 when Paul Thiessen was still a member and he quoted um, Robert Kennedy. And, and at the time in, in the late 60s, there was a conversation about um, uh, lawlessness, civil unrest. And Robert Kennedy said, if you don't ask about the fundamental injustice that gave rise to the civil unrest, you'll never get at the root of what's going on. And we still have the exact same need today, which is to center our inquiry on what is the underlying injustice that leads people to, to make their voices heard um, by protest. All right, last question and we'll wrap up. Uh, Senator, this is from Esme Murphy. Senator Gazelka says the emergency in the COVID pandemic is over, is it? It is not over. Um, I think that um, it is really a grave concern for all of us looking at the numbers in Arizona, Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Texas. Um, I hate to think that that is our future. I read uh, over the weekend that they are moving in the refrigerated trucks to uh, Texas to serve as temporary morgues. Um, uh, on the same day I read that information, I read that there were no COVID-19 deaths in the state of New York. So we went from using state resources in New York state to build mass graves and use mass graves and to have refrigerated morgue trucks outside of hospitals because the facilities uh, were beyond capacity to accommodate the amount of death. To that happening in the state of Texas and, um, you know, we have to very seriously consider what it could be in the future for Minnesota. So the emergency is in no respects over. All right, that'll do it. Thanks everybody. Thank you.